There's a lot of important decisions we make as investors every single day. When to start investing, which individual funds to buy, how much money to put in, what we're prioritizing both in our investments and the rest of our financial life, if there are any special investing strategies such as options trading that we want to use, and so on. But perhaps the most important decision we make, aside from the obvious initial decision to start investing in the first place, is not which specific investment to buy, but rather how to fit the investments we do eventually choose to buy together into a portfolio for a long-term, happy, and hopefully reasonably stable investing journey. Because while choosing individual investments that will provide us with good long-term returns is important, it isn't necessarily the most important factor for everyone or in every situation. We can find many examples of investors who have made great choices in their investments, at least in terms of long-term returns on paper, who still did not see much growth in their portfolios because they either sold their investments too quickly, bought at an inopportune time, or experienced some other misstep in their financial lives that caused things to not go according to plan. We can also find some examples of investors who invested their money in lower return investments that actually out-earned investors who sunk all of their money into high returning assets, even if neither investor made any notable mistakes. It's actually really cool how this sometimes works, and was really eye-opening to me when I first learned about it. But with that in mind, today we're going to be talking about how investments fit together in a portfolio, and why, in some situations, considering this could be even more important than simply considering long-term investment returns. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. So when looking at various investments inside a portfolio, what are some of the things we should be considering? Obviously, how much money we expect to make with the investment is incredibly important, but what are the other considerations? Well, you may disagree with me here, and that's perfectly fine, but in general, I feel there are at least five things that we should take into consideration when choosing our investments. First is the expected return, obviously. Second is the dependability or trustworthiness of the investment. By this I mean that an investment portfolio should not be overly sensitive to when you start investing in it. You should be able to reasonably expect solid returns over any normal investing period, say, 10 years or so, whether you started investing in 2003, 1993, or 2013. Third is the consistency of the portfolio, or its ability to regularly produce returns that are at least in the same ballpark as what the long-term average would imply. Fourth is the portfolio's tranquility, or its ability to either avoid falling prey to negative black swan events altogether, or at least not dive nearly as far as its contemporaries during those times. And fifth is the portfolio's resiliency, or its ability to bounce back quickly from any setbacks that it does experience, as most investments will from time to time. Let's take a look at each of these qualities in turn to see why they're important to consider. The first quality to consider is the expected return on the investment, which we generally measure by the long-term average annualized return figures that we see on the investment's prospectus charts. It'll usually say that the investment has returns of X% percent over the last 1, 3, 5, and 10 years, as well as since the fund's inception. It'll also show you how something like $10,000 invested over a certain period of time would have grown over those years. On the one hand, this is an incredibly important number to consider, because the difference between a $10,000 investment making 10% per year for 40 years and that same $10,000 investment making 4% per year for 40 years is huge. The investment with a 10% annualized return would grow to over $452,000, while the investment with a 4% return would only grow to around $48,000. On the other hand, it doesn't always do the best job of visualizing for us how that 40-year ride is going to feel, even if the following 40 years pans out roughly the same as the time period that they're showing us. That brings us to dependability. As I said, dependability is a portfolio's ability to generate returns that are in the ballpark of what the long-term average would imply, regardless of when you actually start investing in them. It's basically a way of measuring sequence of return risk, and it can make a huge difference in certain situations. For instance, let's say that John had a portfolio that was entirely filled by a single S&P 500 index fund. From 1980 through 2019, Vanguard's S&P 500 index fund, ticker symbol VFINX, averaged a return of about 10.6% per year, assuming you reinvested all your dividends. However, that return changes, sometimes quite substantially, depending on what time period you're looking at. The most obvious instance of this would have been the lost decade of the 2000s. From January of 2000 through December 2009, Vanguard's fund would have actually lost money. 
a $10,000 investment would have fallen to around $9,150 by the end of that decade. That's a loss of a little under 1% per year on average. However, the 2010s told a completely different story, with a $10,000 investment at the beginning of the decade rising to around $32,600 by the end of it. That's a return of almost 13% per year on average. Compare this to a portfolio that consists of a few different investments, which, for the sake of this hypothetical, will say that Jane splits her money evenly between stocks, bonds, and gold, using the S&P 500 index fund for the stocks, a total bond market index fund for the bonds, and just a simple gold index fund for gold. From 2000 through 2009, Jane's net worth would grow from her initial $10,000 investment to around $21,800, for an average annualized return of about 8.1% per year, which is quite a bit better than the all-stock portfolio did during that specific time frame. Assuming Jane had invested during the 2010s instead of the 2000s, her ending net worth would have been around $21,450 which isn't as good as the all-stock portfolio did during that decade, but it is pretty similar to what happened to Jane's portfolio in the 2000s. Interestingly, despite the fact that the all-stock portfolio had the highest returning decade, it actually would have been out-earned by the more dependable alternative since the start of the new millennium. $10,000 invested in an all-stock portfolio in January of 2000 would have grown to around $33,350 by the start of 2020, whereas Jane's more diversified portfolio would have grown to around $37,500. And that's of course not counting the most recent downturn we're still in the midst of as of this recording, which a more balanced portfolio has handled a little bit better than an all-stock portfolio. The point is, the huge gap between the two decades of these two scenarios suggests that a portfolio composed entirely of an S&P 500 index fund is probably not the most dependable option, even if its long-term returns have been very respectable. But depending on where you are in your financial life, those downturns may or may not be a deal breaker. If you're 20 something and investing purely to build up a nest egg for retirement, assuming you don't intend to retire super early, you may be able to stomach a couple of down years that take some time to fully recover from. In fact, if you're able to continue investing during those down times, this might actually be seen as more of a feature of your portfolio than a bug of it, because it'll allow you to buy more shares when they're on sale and increase your overall returns when all is said and done. However, if you're putting money away for a shorter term goal, this kind of risk may be a deal breaker for you. The same could be said about the levels of short term volatility that some investments experience. Which brings us to consistency, or the ability to regularly produce returns that are similar to the long term average of the investment. Obviously, stocks are not a very good example of this. They've had years where their values have fallen by 30, 40, or even 50%, if not more, despite the fact that, over the long haul, their average returns are usually in the 7 to 10% per year range. Bonds are a much more stable investment, historically speaking. In fact, assuming you reinvest any income you get from it, Vanguard's total bond market fund hasn't lost more than a few percentage points in a single year since 2000. Sure, its highest years haven't been nearly as impressive as the S&P 500, but its typical year is much closer to the 5% or so that we've come to expect from these investments. And that can be very valuable in certain situations. Another thing that can be very beneficial, especially if you're in a situation where you're more sensitive to volatility, is a portfolio's tranquility. A tranquil portfolio may not be able to completely avoid a downturn, but it can at least minimize the damage of it by having multiple types of investments that tend to behave differently. A couple of portfolios that do this well are Ray Dalio's All Weather Portfolio, or the All Seasons variant discussed in Tony Robbins' book, Money, Master the Game. This simplified portfolio has you split your money between various asset classes like stocks, bonds, commodities, and gold. The idea is that you'll have some portion of your money invested in something that will likely be doing relatively good regardless of what's going on in the outside world. If inflation is going crazy like it was during much of the 1970s and early 1980s, that's okay, because gold is probably doing alright. If inflation is falling, that's okay. You have some long-term bonds that can hold you over with solid returns until things get back to normal. If the economy is booming, great, stocks are probably doing well. If, on the other hand, growth is slowing, well, you know what, that's okay too, for you have bonds, gold, or even cash, depending on the situation, to help balance out the losses from stocks. You get the idea. You still may experience downturns like any other investment, but they likely won't be as severe as the 50, 60, or 70% drops we've sometimes seen with all stock portfolios. And as a result, it's much easier to recover from those losses quickly, 
Which brings us to resiliency. Resiliency is the last quality we'll be discussing today because while there are a lot of things that you can do to manage risk in your investments, there really isn't any true bulletproof way to ensure that you'll never experience any setbacks. The best we can do is try to minimize the damage of those setbacks and recover from them quickly. A portfolio's tranquility lessens the severity of the setbacks, but resiliency shortens their duration. After all, you could theoretically put all of your money into cash and cash equivalents, and you'd rarely see huge losses. Sure, occasionally the portfolio may not quite keep pace with inflation, but more often than not, you wouldn't be falling behind by too much. On the other hand, it comes with a pretty significant drawback. Since your returns would be considerably lower over the long haul, any setbacks you do experience could take quite a bit of time to recover from. For instance, say that you had $10,000 invested in a money market fund, making 2% a year. During your first year, inflation was pretty high, say 15%. That means that after adjusting for inflation, your real return was something like negative 13%. Afterward, say inflation cools down to about 1.5% per year. How long will it take to recover that initial 13% loss? The answer is about 28 years. So while on the one hand it's great that the worst setback was like 13% and it only happened in one year, on the other hand it took a lot longer to recover than most of us would be willing to wait. This is not likely to lead to a long and happy investing journey, so it's important to put together assets that will counterbalance each other to a certain degree, but still have strong enough growth potential to recover quickly from any losses that they do inevitably experience. But that's an overview of five things to keep in mind when putting together your portfolio. What quality do you think is most important? Is there any that you think I missed? Let me know in the comments section below. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.